keep watching Rise and Shine. It's a Sunday morning. It's the 23rd and we did tell you that we'll be having the guest in the show right after the break. And it's time for me to welcome Mr. Vipalavan Gasekaru, former diplomatic envoy for Sri Lanka in Norway, Director General of Sri Lanka Tourism and now General Manager of Sri Lanka Convention Bureau of the Ministry of Economic Development. Good morning to you. And Good morning. It's great to have you back on show. Right. And it's, it's a great day for me to address your audience also on a day like this, it's a person for a day and it is on a day like this the Buddhism was introduced uh, to Sri Lanka and since then um, Sri Lanka has predominantly uh, been a Buddhist country and we have um, preserved this, uh, the core messages of Buddhism uh, for over 2600 years now so it's certainly a, a privilege for me to be here this morning. And uh, Mr. Pupula, now as you very clearly mentioned it's pride and place for Sri Lanka when it comes to Poston Pool from Poe Day. You're going back in time way beyond 2000 years where Sri Lanka actually received Buddhism from India. And is there any opportunity or is there a way forward when it comes to preserving the values and the knowledge that we have gathered from that? And Sri Lanka, as you mentioned, being a predominantly Buddhist country for more than 2500, 2600 years now, is there a way forward? In this? Yes, now. As far as the, the core message is concerned, I would say um, the core message is preserved and um, uh, with due respect to the Mahasangha and also the Buddhist scholars as well as the Buddhist scriptures, um, the message that uh, Buddha has conveyed is really simple and it's a way of life. Some people, there are so many definitions, some people call it um, end of suffering and uh, or attaining enlightenment or a path to nirvana so there are so many definitions but there is a problem when it comes to you know over that over several centuries uh, any doctrine is subject to uh, uh, deviations and one reason i would say is that there are volumes and volumes of scriptures and there are over 20,000 sutras and, and there's Abhidhamma which deals with uh, mind and matter and running into pages and pages. So people uh, tend to interpret this Dhamma in their own ways and that would lead to some kind of um, uh, deviations and that is inevitable. Uh, so I think uh, the way forward is to go back to basics and stick to what the Buddha has said long, long time ago. Uh, and there are some sutras that are very, very short because the whole idea is that, you know, this is not a knowledge that you can give from one person to another. It's a, it's a self-inquiry. You have to discover this yourself. And as long as that message is conveyed to the people, I think that is sufficient. Right. And uh, talking about the introduction of Buddhism on a day like today and uh, I mean, it has come down to Sri Lanka over 2,000 years ago, and uh, we uh, we know that who brought in Buddhism to our country, Venerable Mahinda, was a tourist himself. And uh, for the Sri Lankans to accept it, and it's of, of course a very divine thing. But do you think, since uh, Sri Lanka has become a Buddhist country now, do you think that foreigners, the tourists from outside, come into Sri Lanka to learn Buddhism? Mm, yes. Now, I'm also coming from the tourism background. And yes, uh, Venerable uh, Arhat Mahinda Thero was a tourist and, and that's how uh, this Dhamma was gifted to Sri Lanka. But uh, it is uh, a pity that, uh, that Sri Lanka is not able to reciprocate this to uh, the other countries. There are a large number of tourists and, and the current studies show that as high as 40 million people travel out of their country seeking some kind of inner peace and they go to various places and there are indeed places available like Amaravati in England or Plum Village in France and then you have this Wat Po Pang in Thailand and there is also a, a place which is managed by Muji, the famous Muji and that is in Monte Sahaja in Portugal and there is also a place in Perth that is this Ajahn family um, in Perth and there are so many places uh, which offer this doctrine to people who are seeking inner peace. And somehow, in Sri Lanka, uh, we have not been able to provide this opportunity for people. Uh, there may be so many reasons. Uh, one uh, issue that I see is that 
most of these foreigners who come here they are here for a very short period and probably they tend to see these traditions being practiced as rituals because they look for some kind of a rationale in doing something you know you can't just say okay you do this uh, and this will happen and when they look around and they don't see that much of um, uh, the dhamma or the core message of dhamma being conveyed so so they are wondering what's what's going on so that is uh, one problem and there are indeed some meditation centers in sri lanka and the problem is that the meditation courses they are offering are very rigorous it's a very stringent kind of a thing and and when you have only 10 days holiday uh, they don't have um, uh, that much of time to go through the entire course from meditation on tranquility and then switch on to vidarshana or insight meditation and that's a, a kind of a rigorous uh, exercise which they cannot go through now, as i said before the, the message is very simple as if, as long as you can uh, convey the message which help them to start the self inquiry that is sufficient because the discovery is entirely up to you you know you cannot give that you know it's not a knowledge based exercise it's a it's a language of heart so it's um, uh it's something that you have to discover yourself so therefore if that opportunity is given to them now uh, if you go to youtube today there are so many spiritual leaders like ekatulla or bethani you know uh or moji and adhyanti and there are millions of hits on this uh, and all they say is you know these are all buddhistic teachings but they don't use the label buddhism mahabuddha or Buddha or anything and they don't use any pali you know it's just no longer understood by people and uh, always you see uh, the core message is conveyed and allowing people to start thinking so that's uh, what is required to be done and it is more like an inspirational video um i wouldn't use the word it's a, a you know you start thinking about yourself mm-hmm. you know so you are inspired to do that yes in in that sense um but all this time you are seeking this this happiness from an outside object whereas buddha said no there is no way you can get happiness from it it's all within so you are directing the attention of people to see within and to see whether there is a self that you have been nurturing all this time and and if you make this discovery you know the enlightenment is not something suddenly you know you become a saint and you start performing miracles it's it's not something like that but when you discover that this is an illusion and yourself is an illusion the whole world is an illusion you are relieved completely but your life goes on and in fact recently i saw a video clip by uh, this katolle a very famous german today um and he was addressing the google staff and as you know google they they have all young people and their management style is completely different and people were wondering you know come on how can this person you know, he's he has is teaching buddhism virtually and and people have this tendency to believe that buddhism is you know detachment you detach from this that and how a cartoon is possibly telling these youngsters and at the end you know it's a one hour interview when i was surprised myself and he established that you know you know like thoughts for example you know most of the thought 90% of your thoughts you have thought about these thoughts before many many times you know so he was explaining this to these people and at the end he established that you know you will be able to be more creative and more innovative because you are living in the present moment and you have you don't have expectations you know that bother you uh, all the time or you don't live in the past you know this is uh, what he explained in that one hour discourse and everyone was impressed and miss people as you very clearly mentioned it's not that enlightenment means that you start glowing or something yes, like that yes. it's just that you find your inner peace and as you mentioned here in sri lanka we do not uh, target a particular audience for that matter now as you said when it comes to meditation and all that it's very rigorous when it comes to a lot of places uh, is there opportunity for sri lanka to develop a niche where they could actually do something to make sure that we get foreigners to this country purely for the <coughs> aspect of meditation and maybe finding that uh, peace within themselves i think uh, there's a one technical problem uh, that is language uh, we need to speak to them either in english or german or or french because you have to speak to them in their own language 
and you don't find that many teachers around and uh, and somehow we have to have this outward looking uh, approach when it comes to dhamma and to develop some kind of a program um, that could that is acceptable to the foreigners who come down and and i myself um, you know i'm in touch with most of the tourism plants and tourism hotels in sri lanka and whenever there is an opportunity to the people you know who want to know whether you know is there any way that we can get to know a little bit of buddhism and uh, we come across this difficulty of finding the right person to go and address them and there are instances that i myself have gone to these places and and you know just just uh, just a discussion about maybe one hour or so and then come back so that is a good start you know if you can uh, initially get uh, the right type of people uh, who can speak the language and then stick to the basics you know that that's a key word because if you start using a lot of pali using a lot of um, things that are ritual based then you tend to draw them away uh, from the 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 core teachings and talking about uh, getting down people to sri lanka and teaching buddhism that's basically what we discuss now and uh, in comparison to what's happening in sri lanka you know you see a lot of crime rate you see a lot of drug addiction and uh, a lot of uh, murders happening in Uh, problems with religion caste and creed and about the greed for power so what do you think should be done with regards to this as a buddhist country i don't think uh, these things are encouraged to be happening in the country alone yes uh, i think um, sri lanka being a buddhist country it should be a uh, ideally model for mm-hmm. for the countries when it comes to the crime rate and whatever that we are seeing today this is probably the paradox uh, between the the virtues and and the reality uh, let me give you a small example now i can see thousands of thousand students attend this dham pasal on poedi which is a good thing and it's a good system because you learn buddhism you learn virtues and you learn how to respect your teachers and parents and and at the same time the the biography of buddha and little bit of sutras and you learn all that so that's a because in school probably you don't have time now what really happens is now most of these students they they learn all these things but as they grow up they realize that the reality is not not exactly that you know for instance uh the factors to which you give recognition recognition to it is either you know take you know i have heard this you know he is from a good stock what is the good <clears throat> stock you know what is the criteria or the other day you know i was talking to my cousin and she was trying hard to put this child to one of the schools and i said why that school you know you're trying so hard and you know and she was saying well that's number 1 school and this is you know what the the, the student has been selected is number 3 so i said um, is there a correlation between that to the number of students entering university or is that no 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 this is uh, rated number 1 and that's a profile of i said what happens in 5 years time if that number 1 comes down to number 5 and this number 3 goes up because you you don't know what's happening tomorrow so people have come up with their own you know and at the same time the power uh, that you know you always um, I, i have heard this many many times he's a big shot in this place you know so how, how do you define that and at the same time you know if you see someone driving a car and you said you are using the same car is it you know if you are not you know change your this thing that means you are not doing well not going so, with the trend yes so so you know the 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 matters that are important to them are not in line with what you learn you know when you are small so there is a contrast in this situation i think that is the that is the biggest problem and then eventually when they enter the commercial world the corporate world it is even worse you know the, i was talking to a ceo at a function recently and and i was simply asking a very basic uh, mundane question i said i have seen in newspapers you know this company has earned so many billions of rupees after tax you know and that company has it i said don't they have a system to do a survey to find out whether the people are happy you know and you know you can do a secret kind of a survey to ascertain whether they are happy and obviously if you ask them openly they'll say yeah yeah i'm very happy but but uh, but the reality perhaps you need a job you know and that's why you're hanging around and i was uh, in a way uh, surprised to hear the answer you know and 
and probably from his point of view because okay his performance is also judged by the profitability or productivity whatever and they said no we are we are ruthless you know we we, we don't look at you know we at the end of the day you have to make that much of profit and so these youngsters who learn dhamma when they were small when they get into the world and they find look you know this is what we have learned is not important so they tend to improvise and uh, now i i teach in a couple of universities marketing and event management i ask them when they go for interviews and um, you know the the hr managers directors the way these youngsters are uh, interviewed and the first question they ask have you read our annual report and where do you think our company is heading for or they will ask um, uh, what how can you contribute to the profitability of our organization so so they 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 start you know rehearsing and improvising and the companies also make the blunder by selecting the wrong people because you know if you speak well if you act well they think okay this guy is good so eventually you find that you know they are also not doing well after a while the, the company is also crash and they don't know why so it these are paradoxes you know you you need to live with the reality and that is what buddhism is all about and uh, so now as uh, you mentioned very clearly when it comes to day to day life people look at it in a very different way to what they were taught when we were kids when we were uh, when we were schooling we were taught something totally different to what we experience now why is there an illusion of this this nature um i think that is because you are moving away and away from uh dhamma the core message is, the core message mm-hmm. because all the activities all what you do um revolve around uh, nurturing the self because uh the buddhism says you know the self is an illusion what you have is the idea that you have about yourself mm-hmm. but as a self you know um it's a analysis of your mind and body what is your mind it's a conglomeration or a stream of thoughts one thought after the other and the one thought is reinforced by another thought which is based on your past experience and the expectations of so your the entire world is in your mind um and and also there are so many short discourses that buddha has given for people to start thinking um like um live in the present moment or they say uh, buddha once said that all that you have to lose in this life is what you are clinging on to otherwise you don't lose anything mm-hmm. so there's nothing to worry about and and you know this is this is the it it is even going beyond attachment what you are clinging on to which is not really there it doesn't mean you know that you have to give up everything and walk into a forest and start meditating you can continue with your life now there's another simile that he has given which i like very much personally uh, he has said that things are not what they appear to be no are they otherwise uh, it's it's little confusing but that reflects the subtlety in this dhamma you know because everything is judged by the five senses that is, that are interpreted by your mind and you need to find out whether there is anything beyond that if you accidentally touch um, a lamp you know a wick which is lighting and suddenly you pull this your hand away your mind doesn't do that it's your consciousness you know and it is there with you all you have to do is to discover that but you are so much indulged in your day to day activities you know you pull your hand back quickly instantly and promptly while your mind is you know far away thinking what you have to do tomorrow and what has happened and you know regretting over something or brooding over something um, and creating this false self so once you have discovered that uh, you are you are greatly relieved so that is what is expected you know it's a, it's a great philosophy it's a great doctrine it just that you know people are now unfortunately majority uh, are trying to use this doctrine and to to enhance the position of the self which is which is very very uh, contradictory to the the dhamma and very true because uh, as we have always seen uh, for anybody when it comes to corporate world 
they'll start off at a very low level, probably earn a very small amount. But uh, going up the ladder, probably by the time they end up at corporate managerial level, it's just that even though they probably earn maybe 10, 20 times more than what they started off with, <clears throat> still it seems like it's not enough because they gradually look for all sorts of luxurious stuff around them and then end up looking for a little bit more all the time. Uh, is it a lot to do with uh, the rat race that we are in or is it just that we are, as you clearly mentioned, that <coughs> people are moving, <coughs> sorry, moving away from the Dhamma, the teachings that we have got because uh, it's not the same because when it comes to even uh, at directorial levels, when it comes to managing a business, people, are, as you quickly mentioned, looking at the bottom line numbers instead of looking at uplifting the employee's uh, livelihood. Absolutely. So there are several ways of looking at this. Um, what is the purpose? You know, if you walk into some of these um, organizations, you find there's a beautiful mission statement saying that, you know, we are in this business and our final objective is to ensure that um, we do something um, positive to the, the mankind or the, or the people in this country. You know, these are beautiful words, but if you really see what is happening inside, it is not so. It is, these are highly profit-driven organizations. And there is uh, one uh, a manager whom I met, whom I know very closely recently, and he had he, he was working in a very reputed organization and he has retired and, and he's only 52 years. So I asked him, look, you know, you have a long way to go. And he said, look, if I continue, and he has done well in terms of material, you know, and how much he has earned and, you know, whatever. And he said, I left because I couldn't take it anymore because uh, if I had continued, I would have got a stroke or something and gone, you know, probably in a couple of years' time. But now I'm okay, I'm a consultant, I just do a little bit of thing. You see, this is why these so-called, you know, the material world, the people are now seeking this inner peace because they have found that, you know, they had a lot of desires, ambitions, and when one desire is fulfilled, another arises, then you go after that, then something else arises. There's no end to this. So therefore, one day you realize that, no, this is not the happiness. There is something else, and I need to go after that. So that is where they start looking for this inner peace. Um, and even from the the corporate's point of view that I know some years ago when we were learning marketing uh, there was an entrepreneur who has built his company and the day he was uh, you know he was very sick he was old and he was uh, kind of thinking and then his children were around him and they had to take over his business and he said then that he was in the manufacturing um, uh, company and he said uh, before he died he said ensure that my customers, the consumers, get a good product from this company. And they immediately made it a made it the mission statement. You know, so those days there were no visions, you know, mission statement. But subsequently they, the children decided to yes, you know, that was our father, father's vision. And he had kept this company for over forty years. You know, that's how, how you manage because finally it is not the system. In fact, I mentioned this conversation that I had with the CEO and what he said was, you know, we, we run our organization ruthlessly. And once we introduce the system, the system runs the organization. So what about the people? What about their feelings? What about their livelihood? What about their, you know, finally, the, 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 the human aspect of this. It's completely ignored. And I don't think it's a good trend because what is happening in Europe, I believe, is partly due to this. You know, people have run out of jobs and, and they have, nothing is moving because you have ignored the human aspect and you have indulged yourself in systems. And suddenly you realize that they have not fulfilled the basic requirements of people and people are without jobs now. In, in some of the countries, I'm sure you would have seen uh, in the news. And very yes. true. And also talking about finding inner peace and satisfaction, Mr. People, we noticed that many people do not have the time to spend time with their family or actually go out with them, have fun and enjoy at home. So I think it all relates to all this systematic way of life and you know you've got to focus on earning more, living a better life and but eventually they do not get that. So what, what do you think is the best way to put it in practice in the way which the Buddha has taught us? Uh, you, you, you accept what the basics that you require to deal with your life. Let me give you another example. Now, this year we are holding the biggest conference or rather the second biggest
conference by end of the year which is Chodam that is going to bring in 50 world leaders. Now we held a non-aligned conference way back in 1976 that brought in 83 world leaders into this country. We never had mobiles, we didn't have cars, we didn't have uh, emails, we, don't, we didn't have any of those sophisticated. But we handled that conferences professionally uh, on par with international standards. How did we do that? Because of this human aspect. You know, we used all the manual system to do that. Of course, one might argue that, you know, you can't go back. I'm not referring <coughs> to that. It's just that, you know, as long as you live with what you, with your essential needs, that that will help you to have more time with your family, with your, you know, um, it's a, when, when you get into the system-driven life, then obviously, you know, that's why most of the time, you know, you need your mobile and the messages, emails, everything. Uh, you can attend to all that, you know, in, in a particular time. And and by by doing that, you are not productive either because you make wrong decisions also because you are, you are in this red race. And sometimes you make all the wrong decisions and you face the repercussions also. Um, and a lot to do with uh, technology, I think, because so, uh, now we are, when we look at it, everybody has got a sophisticated mobile phone because when it was introduced to the country, it was huge and it was something that you had to take someone to carry with right. but now it has developed into such level that even at six digit numbers maybe hundred thousand or even more people tend to buy it without realizing that uh, it's a matter of communicating without realizing they have gone in for the secondary values of the unit without actually looking at the core value where it's about making a call to someone when it is necessary when it is at an emergency because you have enough and more landlines we have lost the interest of why a mobile phone was uh, developed and it is in in case of you are traveling somewhere, it's to convey a message. And now what it what it has actually become is it has become a fashion accessory, and people tend to look for sophisticated things, of colors, and all that. And when it comes to anything and everything now, when it comes to even computers, we human we we have the opportunity of deciding on various aspects. But when it comes to computer, it's either a yes or a no, or try or retry or something like that. It's accept or cancel. Right. Now we have basically given ourselves, basically restricted ourselves from looking out the window and looking at the global aspect of it. Maybe when it comes to life, how well we can actually celebrate life. We have uh, restricted ourselves to maybe accept or reject. Um, another thing in support of what you said that the technology that has come to stay and every day it's advancing. Now, some years ago, when they introduced uh, the virtual meetings, you know, you can have video conference, and there was a huge threat that it will have an adverse effect on the real conference business. And everyone thought, you know, the virtual meetings, it's going to be the future. People don't have to travel. People don't have to meet. But nothing happened. You know, the conference market has grown. So people have realized that, you know, this human interaction, human to human, it, it cannot be replaced by the technology. Now that is a fact. Now if I use a mobile as you said, you know, I don't use half of the features that are given then. I don't even know because it's not, you know, so sometimes you might pay price the price to buy a particular machine and, and you don't even know how to operate. All you need is communication. And sometimes, and irony is that, you know, you, you carry now that you mentioned mobile, you carry a mobile, but when you need to contact someone, you can't contact him on the mobile either. <laughs> because you use it, your, your, your whims and fancies, okay, I can't be contacted at this time, you switch off that and you put it in your that's it. <laughs> you know, if for an emergency also, you can't reach the person. So the main purpose is not done and actually we've come to the close of the program, Mr. Vimula, time certainly fry, uh, flies, I'm telling you. So, uh, you know, with that, it's time for us to wrap things up on Rise and Shine and talking about technology, make use of it in the right way and I'm pretty sure you'll be on track and you can move on and, you know, do the simple things, that's best. And thank you very much, Mr. Vipula, for being a part of the show and it was a great honor having you in. Thank you very much indeed.